I just want to um, echo Boer's warm welcome. It is great to see you all here in person. Uh, many, mostly new faces, but lots of old and dear ones, not aged, uh, but old friends uh, for many of us. Um, and it's great to be here in person. Um, so, uh, and this, you know, just all that work that Urs mentioned uh, coming to fruition as people uh, come together, and we hope to tap into a little bit of that energy and um, uh, diversity of uh, thought a, a bit in this session, uh, which as noted is gonna be super brief. Um, so, uh, what we're gonna do are three things. Um, one is um, note, um, about the uh, about the heat map itself, sort of the pre-conference submissions that we asked you for, that your ideas for um, the uh, OER uh, impacting uh, e, the E, as we like to say, so open resources on education. Two, uh, describing the cluster map process and goals. That's something that Ur's referenced. We're going to do over the course of the next three days. And three, to have a conversation about a brief conversation about opportunities and challenges. Um, uh, of two open resources uh, for impacting education. So the idea here is to feed you back a little bit of what you said to us about uh, your ideas and to go forward asking about some of the challenges and opportunities that you're seeing in the field uh, to get the juices flowing and to start to um, build a, a basis um, for these next three days together. Um, so um, we don't have enough time to do that, but if you guys are game, we're gonna do it anyway. So uh, please be game, which means we have to be brief, we have to be on point, uh, thoughtful, even though it's the afternoon, you may have jet lag and you may want to get to the next session to see our pals from Hewlett or to the drinks afterwards, I don't know. Um, so we will also have some help uh, and that comes in a variety of different forms. One, digital tools. So there's a Twitter hashtag, which should be in your booklet, uh, OER12HF. Uh, there's a wiki, there's a website. Everything is available there online should you feel uh, lost at any moment. Uh, but um, we also have lots of people, as noted, uh, who will help. Um, and for this particular session, there are mic runners that will help us in the conversation part. And uh, we're also going to um, have scribes, as with all the sessions, who are taking notes, um, not minutes per se, but, but notes from the session. So take notes uh, as you see fit. Um, but know that others are trying to do that as well. Um, so I uh, want to go now to this, um, these submissions. And I don't know why th this is up now, but it is. Um, uh, and that is to say that um, we asked for three big ideas to each, we asked each of you for three, three big ideas, things that we needed to do, we could do, um, which we saw as opportunities, challenges, and so forth. Um, we got nearly 200, which we thought was quite an amazing response, uh, that were really uh, diverse, rich, um, and interesting, um, that are clearly reflective of a very dynamic uh, space, which has tremendous variation across the country and around the world, um, depending on any number of things. Um, uh, full of opportunity and need, but also full of wonderful insights from folks in this room. Um, so with the help of uh, Corey, Justin, and a team of other Burke folk, we attempted a preliminary mapping. So this is a, we were gonna say this is very rough. This is definitely an alpha version of the space um, based on the ideas that you submitted. And so what we're trying to do here is um, create a visualization that's something of a complement to the um, evidence hub built by the Knowledge Media Institute at Open University, um, but really to kind of feed you back those ideas in this imperfect rendering that shows how kind of rich and overlapping the environment it is and hopefully gives us an idea uh, of, how, of what this space looks like as perceived by this group, this sort of idea space. Um, so it really does uh, a, a very rough job, but hopefully uh, some work uh, to organize and visualize that diversity of ideas. Um, and uh, what we did to kind of make it a little more um, digestible was to categorize those ideas against, or to create categories around those ideas and subcategories still further so that, uh, so that they're not just fully amorphous. That said, these categories are overlapping, they're imperfect, there's all kinds of um, uh, uh, problems, not due to anyone's uh, lack of uh, good work, but just due to the complexity of the ideas themselves. So um, we're gonna offer those categories and some other bits, and we would invite you not to get bogged down in those imperfections, but really to focus on um, what, you, what we can take away from this, and also invite you to, to explore it um, via computers, which you may have, or that there are posted around uh, the conference now and over the next days. Um, so that's the sort of the map. Now I wanna go uh, ask Rob to introduce this because these categories actually come from economics, so I refuse to introduce them. Um, my inability, it's gonna work. Let's go. Uh, how's that? Super, uh, good afternoon everybody, another warm welcome. So pleased to have you all here, looking forward to work with you over the next few days. So as Colin mentioned, is this not working? Can you not hear me? Should I repeat everything Rob says? <laughs> no. 
Please do, yeah. Um, so as Colin mentioned, uh, we received a ton of great ideas from you guys. Uh, it's overwhelming both the diversity and the complexity of the ideas that, that you submitted. So what we tried to do is we tried to work them into an order and visualize them. So the first thing we learned was that many of the ideas do not conform to the order that we tried to impress upon them. So <laughs> we're dealing with a lot of non-conforming ideas, and hopefully we can fix that over the next few days. But we want all the ideas to conform, please. And in, in any case, we, we, we forged ahead and we created a, a map. So I'll describe four uh, categories mm -hmm. we gave to this. So um, let's start with micro. So micro refers to ideas that focus upon uh, creators and users. So uh, if we dig down into it, there's a, there's a bunch of suggestions on teaching and learning, which are uh, helping teachers adopt OER uh, materials essentially under guidance and training. Uh, similarly, allowing teachers to teach better and uh, within this micro category, we're also looking at ideas that are helping creators to create more. If we move to the mezzo category, um, this is meant to capture the, uh, the distribution, so kind of the, the weaving together of the market, as it were. So uh, elements that would help in the distribution and uh, in, in bringing the pieces together, as it were. So helping with accessibility, with quality control, with search and discoverability, and tools and technology. Uh, so under accessibility, you'll see things such as translating into other languages and uh, helping to bring OER. Um, it's really, this is focused on the intermediaries, this, this category, and the facilitators and the supporters of, of this group. Uh, a lot more energy as well in the tools and technology um, part. Again, we're, we're trying to see what, what are making, what's making the market work, what is linking the creators and the users in this sense. So you'll see ideas such as using GIS and creating APIs and perhaps a new search engine for this. Another category is the macro category. And what this refers to is the larger systemic efforts which uh, might inclu include outreach and campaigns, efforts to change the hearts and minds or the culture and behavioral aspects. It also covers laws and policy frameworks. So you have micro, meso around that, and a larger macro context. Uh, so within this, uh, there's a bunch of things under copyright and licensing and policy. Let's look at community building briefly. Uh, and you'll see a lot of energy that, uh, that went into this sector as well, which is creating uh, communities of developers or bringing together coalitions of, of students to help uh, push the, uh, the spread and use of OER. The final category is research, and this kind of falls outside of the mechanisms of exchange. And what it is, is it's focused more on gathering evidence and creating metrics to assess the impact of OER. It's, it's adding more information to the system. So under assessment, you'll see uh, various ideas per, uh, creating metrics and things like that. So I think we can pivot away from this and go into the density view. And we can see that most of the ideas that were submitted prior to the conference uh, were in the meso range and in the macro range. Probably don't want to read too much into this, but there's not a whole lot in the research category. Coming from a research institution, we're, of course, deeply offended by this, and we hope to <laughs> see a, a profusion of red dots over the next few days. But uh, one of the open questions would be, is, are these relative concentrations and the, uh, the number of the dots and ideas that were produced there, are they indicative of the ideas in this room, or they really reflect a general mapping of the needs and opportunities and challenges of the space? So that is an open question, which uh, I will not attempt to answer right now. Uh, so if we dig down, thank you, Colin, on the subcategories, you can see the same map rendered as, uh, as these subcategories. Uh, again, a whole lot of activity in community building and in, in, the, uh, in the policy realm, a lot in accessibility up in the upper left there, and this brown thing in the middle is tools and, uh, and, and, uh, and technologies. And the last thing we'll throw up there is uh, mapping how you identified yourselves as being um, 
learners or builders or facilitators and the ideas that you put forward. And the nice thing about this is we don't see any, any siloing going on here. The learners are proposing ideas for the builders and facilitators and vice versa. So what this is, is a map of your ideas and the best rendering and imperfect rendering as we could put together. The idea is to take this as a starting point feed this into further work over the next couple days, and hopefully at the other end, kick out more data that uh, we, can, we can look at, analyze, and perhaps even uh, visualize on a screen. So what we're gonna ask you to do is take these ideas as a starting point and improve upon them over the next couple days in cluster groups. So uh, I don't know if you've seen this before. All of this is written down, so if you miss any of it, you have a chance to, uh, to read a clearer version in the, in the printed version later on. But the idea behind the clusters is we've divided you up into groups of eight, and these groups of eight are meant to be diverse groups with different experiences and skills bringing to the table to have a smaller forum for discussion of various ideas. So that's the principal idea behind the clusters. We also gave you an assignment to focus on, which is to develop a, a, a handful of ideas, perhaps two to four, and we're calling them interventions. So we're going from ideas to trying to create concrete interventions. And for that, we have a, uh, a reporting template, which is a number of attributes of the interventions themselves that we would like you to submit in a formal digital format. So if this works the way we hope it's going to work, it's going to be very easy for, you to, for all of you to take ideas, uh, report on them across various, uh, various dimensions. It'll automatically go to us and we'll be able to uh, collect the data, aggregate the data, and throw it back at you um, Thursday afternoon. So th the way the clusters are going to work is you're going to have three meetings. One is this afternoon at 545, I believe, then another one on Wednesday and another one on Thursday. Goal of today's is to meet your fellow members of clusters and uh, make sure you understand the tasks that lie ahead of you. Right? The goal of, of Wednesday is to identify the interventions that you're going to propose collectively from each one of the clusters and start beginning on working on the reporting uh, format. You'll see a draft of that on the wiki. There'll be a, another more formal reporting format coming down the road. And then on Thursday, you will then take your interventions and your reporting thing, you will finalize them, click send, and they will come to us and we'll start crunching the numbers and see what we can do with them. What have I forgotten? Good. Um, okay, so, um, th th so th recognize that that was the whirlwind version. I encourage you to explore all this stuff online, read those materials. Um, uh, come back and let's talk more and we'll of course talk more on Thursday um, with the additional stuff um, but what we would love to do in the next 15 minutes and recognizing that's very little um, is to ask you for sort of a tweet length thoughts on um, why I mean recognizing that there's a tremendous amount of energy in this community and lots happening uh, and lots happening in fact outside this room um, but still um, OER is not where any of us want uh, it to be or think it can be. Um, I feel like this is a you know this is a conversation I have at a cocktail party when I explain it and people say, oh my God, that sounds fabulous. Why is that the, not the best thing since sliced bread? Why aren't we all using it in, in a totally uh, world-changing way? And I say, well, not yet. Soon, 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 it's coming. Okay, so why isn't it here? Um, I want to ask you in this in this next 15 minutes to just give us sort of tweet-length thoughts on. Um, challenges, uh, this is in terms of mapping the problem space to go with the idea space here that we've talked about, things that we need to take into account and address um, in the context of these cluster groups, in the context of all of our conversations over the next three days, um, and uh, as a way to kind of sort of get the juices flowing and thinking, remembering that this is a really diverse group. Uh, you guys all have different perspectives. Many of us are not experts in this space. Uh, we all have something to learn from each other. So I want to invite you to help uh, your colleagues and us all learn. Someone, please, start us off with a thought. Why is an OER what it could be? What, what's the barrier? What's a barrier? Tweet length, and please say your name and your organization oh, first. My name is Andrew Maliazzi from finalsclub.org. And I think sometimes we focus a bit too much on what we think students and teachers need and sometimes forget what they really want. Um, I know I do that often. 
So we need to think more about demand and less about supply. Yeah. Does anybody want to pile on that particular thought? Or can we pivot? OK, we're pivoting. Uh, everybody knows how a newsroom works to some degree. Nobody really knows how Wikipedia works and other peer production processes. Fair enough. So Fair lack enough. of understanding in the back row? Yeah. Is this still, is, to the extent we can, it would be great if we could stay on that topic for just a second, if anyone wants to add to that. Excellent. Hi, Susan Sclafani from the Pearson Education Foundation. And one of the major challenges of teacher demand is teacher time to be able to even find out what is out there and available. So sort of structural issues, accessibility, awareness. There are lots of hidden costs, obviously, in OER, so in your response to your, your tweet-like statement, because uh, uh, free puppies aren't free. <laughs> well put. <laughs> so sad. Who's next right here? Free puppies aren't free. Jay Gribble with Population Reference Bureau. We produce a lot of information that would be great to use, but we're not even aware of this. And so, you know, uh, information generators need to know about the revolution in how information is getting out. Doug Lynch, you pen incentive structures, so it shouldn't be a Herculean task for somebody to use this stuff. David Harris with Connections. I think there's a lack of turnkey solutions for faculty, and they just don't have the time to adopt. We have to make it much easier for them and also raise the bar on quality. Mr. Winbeck. Jeff Seaman, Babson Survey Research Group. Half of all the chief academic officers in higher education are unaware, profess to be unaware, of open education resources. Jafus Anamomesa from TESA. Um, rural teachers are left out of the sea. Is that uh, ac internet access? Is that awareness? Is that all of the above? All right. The OER and then the internet. I suspect there are more barriers in the back corner. There's some in the middle here, too. Uh, Kathy Perkins, FET Interactive Simulations. So one barrier would, would be technology in the schools. A lot of the OER is based on technology and internet and just access to that in the schools, in the classrooms. Lisa Petridis from ISKME. I think the term open isn't used, uh, isn't used uh, consistently. And so we have now things, I just heard somebody say, oh, it's the open web. But that had nothing to do with open. It just meant that it had to do that it was accessible. So I think the terminology we use is not, is not landing where it needs to. Uh, Ronaldo Lemos from Brazil, FGV. So basically, in a country like Brazil, most of the educational materials are actually financed by the state. So one thing that we definitely need is more interfaces with the state. If that happens, we will have a lot of OER. Mm. Thanks. Alan Leishness, Gulf of Maine Research Institute. We're doing a great job with accessibility to content, but we've got miles to go in helping teachers with pedagogy and practice. Nicole Allen from the Student Public Interest Research Groups. We need to do a lot more to engage students and learners as the consumers of OER rather than just thinking about what they need. Jutta um, Tovaranos from the Inclusive Design Research Center at OCAD University and Flow Project. Um, we should, rather than focusing on the areas that the education system feels they are successful in, we should address the areas where they, where they feel they are failing and address the margins, and that will be a great wedge to get into the system. OER should focus on solving world problems rather than on its own perpetuation and, and flourishing. Don't be shy, please. We, we, I, mean, I said we're going to be quick, but that doesn't mean we need to, to stop. <laughs> Keep coming. 
<laughs> Carolina Rossini from OER Brazil project. Uh, I think I'm building on some comments here. So OER really helps co uh, regional communities, local communities, to, to, to engage and bring the history and their activities into the test book, which is something that we don't get with really unified public policy. So engaging with the government and engaging with local communities, I think it's really important. Uh, hi, I'm Vicki Davis with the Flat Classroom Project, and I blog at the Cool Cat Teacher blog. I'm a full-time teacher, and so many resources, we are inundated as teachers, and everybody's trying to do stuff to us and not with us. So Flat Classroom, we have a 1,000 teachers, and we're doing it, and we will align sometimes with OER resources, but right now between countries, there's no mapping between the standards in the UK, for example, and U.S. and the teachers are spending all their time mapping standards, and if it's hard for them to map standards, they're not going to do it. Ariel Diaz with Boundless Learning. Uh, just to echo a few of the trends, I think we're missing great products, really great products focused on students, and really efficient ways to distribute that and get those in the hands of students. John Dorman with the Flipped Classroom. I think we need to get teachers to become, instead of disseminators of knowledge, they should be the chief learners and the facilitators of, of, of learning. And I think that we can, we can do this, um, but we need to keep in mind the, the teachers. Um, I've taught for 25 years and know what it likes to be in the, in the trenches. Uh, Kath Perkins, Fett. So um, since we are at a research institution, I would say uh, assessments in the classroom is one of the key things we don't have really good assessments of the OER materials that's out there. It's just difficult to do in actual K-12 classrooms to get out there. The IRB is a real barrier to that. So anything we can do to make um, that type of research easier to prove the effectiveness of OER. As long as you um, were kind enough to mention research, can I ask anyone else if they want to pile on to the research thread? Are there other kinds of research uh, products or outputs that you would see as being um, valuable, powerful? in this space? In other words, what do we not know that yeah. we would like to know to move forward? Patrick McAndrew from the Open University in the UK. And actually, I think there's a lot of knowledge that needs to really be shared. So getting the evidence of the successes and how we help those successes really spread out. So we know more than we know. David Wiley, Brigham Young University. Um, there is a lot of research out there, but I don't know that we've demonstrated clearly to teachers that there's value. A lot of the research that we've done has been rather esoteric. We've put it in academic journals, done all the good things we're supposed to do. But if we demonstrated value to teachers, they would use it. Mm -hmm. yep. Pete Forsyth uh, with Wiki Strategies. Um, I, I think the, uh, the idea that, uh, that open sharing of educational resources is actually not something new and that this is something that leverages off of a lot of the ways that educators have interacted uh, forever, uh, but adds structure and adds value in that way is probably a useful idea to get up there. Great. Uh, Vijay Kumar from MIT. This is a bit of a restatement, but I think uh, hardening the line between the O and the E in OER, so because the E gets short shift with, the, with too much emphasis on the O. Well, we're here to give it more shrift. <laughs> Shriftier. <laughs> Hi, I'm Madhav Chavan from India. I don't have any experience at all in the Western education systems, but my feeling is that we are uh, <clears throat> trying to fit the technology and the advantages of the technology to the old system, the curriculum, and not using the advantages of this new technology to modify the curriculum and the system as it exists today. We so need more pull than push. A call for broader reform. Yeah. Um, Yuta from the Flow Project again, back to the research question. Given that we have such a diversity of learning approaches and education approaches, I think one of the things that we have the potential to research is how learners who are currently marginalized, who are currently disengaged, reluctant, and all of the uh, learners who are presently not uh, work, uh, successful in the current education system learn. I think I'm Justin Reich. I'm a Berkman Fellow and uh, do research here at the Education School. One piece of research that I'd be really interested in, um, actually probably would 
have a hard time being published in subspaces, but it would be more sort of kind of market research, branding research. You know, I'm thrilled that Vicki and John are here as teachers who can be able to share their perspective. I don't think, I would love to know much more about um, how the phrase open education resources is heard and understood by teachers, heard and understood by students. I mean, the same way that like Kraft would go out and find out, you know, what do people think and feel when they hear macaroni and cheese or something like that. But what's the kind of branding research? What are the feelings, reactions, understandings people have when they hear that term? Um, and uh, and how that how might that shape our communications with people and in, in our work, you know, in partnership with educators. So a second call for branding. Uh, Cable in the back. Hi, uh, Cable Green from Creative Commons. I think in order to get OER known by everybody and to solve the sustainability stresses that we all feel that have OER projects, we need to move toward open policy as being the default. And fundamentally what that means is that when public funds are used in any country in the world, that what's produced with public money either go into the public domain or it has an open license on it so that the public that paid for the educational resources have free and open and legal access to what they paid for. So there will be ample opportunities in other sessions, but should we take like two, three, four more? How about two, how about three more? Yep. And then we have, our hour has arrived, and so has our dean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think as a research, I need evidence on OERs affecting the economics of education. In the back. And SJ. <laughs> yeah, Geoff was on a moment, sir, once again. Uh, I think there are two things that we need to also keep in mind. One is the leaders. Who, who are the leaders who make things happen? And then the policy makers. Who will ensure that uh, if they understand it, will then push it to ensure that uh, the schools also adapt it, you know, and I think this is, these are very important. Great. Yes. SJ Klein, One Laptop Per Child. As long as we view, there's a long-term research question about the social value of making learning resources fundamentally open by default in society. And as long as we view learning materials as something to buy and sell and not as a piece of infrastructure for building a culture, progress is going to be slow. So there's a research question for people really studying economics and social policy and, and civic engagement about how to measure those long-term things, the sorts of societal change that you're not going to see from individual groups who are charting out a five-year course for their own organization. So not a tweet-length comment, but wonderful to end on that profound thought. Um, so I want to thank you all for that quick brainstorming and say it's going to be fed back into notes for you. Um, a wonderful compliment to the ideas you shared.